This is Coda Radio, Episode 1, for June 11th, 2012. You're listening to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. My name is Chris, and joining us every week is our host, Michael Dominic. Hey, Michael. Hey, how you doing, Chris? Hey, man. Welcome to the first episode. Thank you. Now, uh, we are very excited because Jupiter Broadcasting has needed a development show for a long time, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And... uh, we got a, we got a few other things we're going to introduce, but Michael, you mentioned today on the pre-show that one of the things you wanted to do is in our first episode was uh, sort of help fill in some of the beginner blocks for uh, for newbies, right? We're going to cover something called gateway to programming. Tell me a little bit about right. that. Well, the idea is that um, you know there's a lot of ways you can start off programming. You can do it like I did when you're in middle school with the little uh, Q Basic, nice. or you can you know transition to it from something as simple as an accountant doing Excel macros and moving on from there. That's less likely, but there's a, really a lot of ways into the field. Yeah, and now there's some great tools. I mean, one of one of which, like, uh, you know, uh, our very own Brian Lundu creates, and there's all kinds of stepping stones now to get going. So I think we'll cover some of those. Now, the chat room is already giving you a hard time about your microphone. And we should say uh, that we were we were totally on top of this, uh, but, you know, you just can't. Sometimes you get a bad mic. So we actually got Mike, uh, our, a, a road podcaster, and he set it all up, and it was dead on arrival. So uh, hopefully for episode two, we'll have the road podcaster working. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, it's all right. But we are on a backup mic today. But we wanted to press ahead because uh, this week, as we're recording, an hour after we're done, is the Worldwide Developer Conference from Apple. Now, uh, we won't be talking about that much in this episode. If there's some really interesting things to glean, which there likely will be, uh, then we'll probably be talking about that next week. And then after that, it's like Google I.O. Fest. I mean, Google I.O. is going to be huge, and yeah. we're going to talk about that. So the first few weeks of Coda Radio are going to be action-packed. <laughs> Action fact. <laughs> well, why don't we start, Michael, with a uh, a little background on yourself and kind of what you do and all those kinds of things. Sure. So uh, currently, I do a lot of mobile and web development with the occasional desktop app thrown in. Um, right now, I've been under a contract with IAC for six months. Hmm. So that's been predominantly iOS development. Um, I'm really big into HTML5 and standards. I'm a huge fan of open source. In fact, whenever possible, I do try and license code and get my clients to under permissive open source licenses. How have they responded to that? Well, that depends. Uh, So I've had clients where I've had to actually get them to use open source. And when you start from that position, they're not going to contribute anything back. It's just a big step, right? Yeah. Um, And it... From their point of view, they want a vendor they can call and yell at, hmm. which is why they're worried about, you know, using a, let's say, a GitHub library they find. Really? So there's still, you know, because I, I know early on in my in my career, um, I really fought this. And then uh, then the SCO, the SCO lawsuits came around and sort of put this big mystery cloud around open source. And then I really hit a wall. Uh, and then eventually I was able to break through that wall and in the server space, Open source and Linux just became sort of the de facto standard for a lot of developments, or a lot of deployments. Um, and I'm, I'm curious as to maybe why that hasn't made the same leap in, in more of the development side of things, because uh, at least from, from the small company standpoint, it seems to me like they could be capitalizing on a ton of outsourced R&D. Well, so it's also a size issue. Smaller companies and startups I work with in the New York area do tend to be rail shops and pretty much anything open source they can get. The issue is mid-sized to larger companies. Um, there's a lot of them that have legacy systems on, let's say, .NET 2.0. So when they go to develop a new project, it needs to either hook into that system or or they're just not willing. I mean, there's also, you have to think, they have IT staff. If they run their own servers, mm-hmm. and Microsoft IT guys, mm-hmm. good luck getting a Linux server in there to run Rails or, yeah, yeah. or Tango or whatever your stack of choices. Yeah, there is some platform lock-in that uh, happens there, too. So there's also that sort of drive some of that decision-making process. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, 
it is getting a lot better. My current clients are all using open source, and in fact, many of them are contributing back. So it's definitely changing. Well, that's good. That's really positive. So that's that's got to be easier for you going in for a you know you can go into a client. And you, if you can, if you can utilize some open source bit of code, doesn't that save you a ton of time and and make you more money? Yeah, and that's that's what I use to convince clients who don't use open source that it's a good idea. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, something as simple as an iOS networking library. If you don't, if you want to roll your own, it can be quite the uh, quite the time sink and money sink. But if they're willing to use something open source, um, like an ASI or an AF networking. That's a huge savings right there. So is that what you find a lot of your work is, is um, open source mobile app development? Or uh, not open source mobile app development, but just mobile app development using open source where you can? Currently. Um, it shifts between mobile apps and web apps. Hmm. Web apps, really? Gosh, the whole, the, whole where, the whole world has changed. What types of web apps? In terms of platform or in terms yeah, of yeah. No, no. Yeah, well, both. Well, I don't touch Flash with a 90-foot pole. <laughs> so, not Flash. Basically, HTML5 and JavaScript. Uh, currently, I've been using Backbone JS. Yeah, I don't know if you're familiar at all, Chris, with that. Mm -mm. Well, Backbone JS is kind of a. I, I, I want to use the word framework, but it's not that big. Okay. But let's call it a framework that allows you to develop client side JavaScript apps um, much faster than you could doing it in raw JavaScript. Very nice. Again, Leveraging open source, and I haven't contributed to that just because I'm not that deep into it yet. Hmm. But the Backbone JS, that's that's so that's a great example you can use for the client. That's I got you. Huh? I'll check that out. Now, uh, why don't we uh, why don't we uh, keep back on the track of sort of uh, your your experiences and your backgrounds? I I interrupted you there, but. Uh, Continue on. So, what 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 does a day for you in, involve? I, I know you work from home mostly, right? And uh, you have clients and things like that. So, uh, I think people will be interested to know your background in that and how, how you kind of came to become a, a software developer on your own that has contract work and things like that. Because I have to figure that's probably a goal of a lot of people that do software development. Well, it was an accident actually. Uh, in college, I was doing websites for people, and an uncle convinced me to uh, look at some iOS stuff. So I did it. That was early iOS. Oh. And, uh, what happened was I took a job full-time as an iOS developer for a startup in New York. Left there to go work for a different startup. The economy didn't go so good. Got laid off and just started contracting. Opened a company and I've been doing it ever since. Did the startup, uh, did the startup world sort of burn you out from a desk job kind of thing? And you're like, I can't go work for anybody else. Like I just, I'm just going to have to work for myself. I have to say, being an employee at a startup can be rough. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, that was, I've worked for some startups and those, you know, the expectations there are, are pretty brutal. It's almost, you know, depending on the startup, it can be more of a social pressure than you'd expect to just really work and burn yourself out. Okay. Weekends, work from home at night. It yeah. is a startup and that's the culture. Um, and, and most of my clients are startups now, but as a contractor, it's a little different. You're one, you're one or two levels removed, you know, and uh, except for when you go to a client a lot, they kind of become a regular, uh, which you know is is great from a financial standpoint. But it, you start of, you can start to kind of get pulled in a little bit to the politics and kind of get down into the muck of it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so there you go. So now, how long have you been doing uh, your own thing? You Ooh, say a couple been... years. It's been two years now. Yeah, Maybe a little more. It's yeah, it's been quite some time. Well, congrats, man. Congrats yeah. on that. Now and now, you here you are. I know you've wanted to do a podcast for a long time, uh, and uh, Jupiter Broadcasting has a pretty big interest uh, in as far as of a, of a developer audience, and it fits really well with um, TechSnap and the Linux Action Show and Cybyte and Unfilter. They all they all kind of complement each other. And there's uh, sort of a, a more of a focus it gives the network now. So I'm really excited to have a development-based podcast. And, As am I. And there's also, you know, I, I really have no kind of area of expertise. So I will always be deferring to you into the chat room and, and, uh, and to uh, the people who email us, code or radio at jupiterbroadcasting.com. But uh, I'll be here learning. And uh, this next topic, I think, actually is sort of uh, going to be a good primer for me. Should we jump into gateways to programming? Let's do it. All right. Why don't we start? Uh, I know the... Uh, the one thing that uh, I have experience with is probably, like you said, QBasic. Uh, I've done that. I've worked with PHP. Um, you know those kinds of those kinds of things. I've not really done anything serious. So where where should I start? Where should be my first programming language and platform? 
Well, actually, for you, someone who uh, I know you were a sysadmin for a while, mm -hmm. I would recommend just starting with uh, scripting to automate repetitive tasks. So, I, I mean, I sure I script, but I don't consider that you know developing. I don't consider that programming. But I guess you know where do you draw the line? <laughs> so that's a big debate, and it leads to lots of flame. Uh, flame wars. Yeah, uh, that sounds like it could, you could have an entire show just on that topic. <laughs> so the way, I, the way I would question it is, if you write a, a Ruby script to automate some kind of file operation, then you write a Rails app. They're both using Rails. I mean, not Rails, I'm sorry, Ruby. Right. So is Ruby a scripting or programming language? Right, right. And I've seen the same thing with some, I've seen some very complex PHP-based websites, and then I've seen some PHP-based command line scripts. Like, I, I've worked on servers where the guys just the guy that ran it, he just really knew PHP, and whenever he could, he'd run PHP even if it was on the command line. Honestly, you know, labeling scripting or programming isn't that important. It's autom getting the computer to automate a task for you, no matter what. Yeah. Some basic level. Right. So, I, but that's what I would recommend for you. Uh, I know you like the Linux side. Mm -hmm. So, when you did write scripts, uh, were they? I mean, are you going down into Bash? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're Bash scripts. Yeah, Bash, maybe some Perl, a little bit of Perl, but mostly Bash. Let's go. A, let's go a level up from Bash for okay. sure. Yeah, uh, Perl's not bad. I don't. I don't know Perl. Um, it's very old school of you. Yeah, yeah. But if you're really looking for something easy that can teach you object oriented concepts, Ruby is very popular for that right now. That's kind of what I hear. I've also been told Python would be a good route to go. But Python's also very popular. In fact, I think there's a book that was just released by Pragmatic Programmers, um, Hello Python, or something like that, <laughs> specifically designed at beginners. Hello Python, huh? I'm gonna see. All right. So uh, now I see. Here's always been my issue with getting started on this kind of stuff is what I have to start with is so far away from what I actually want to accomplish that it seems like there's such a gap there. That's why tools that allow me to sort of visually create the application to me feel like they are um, less of a hurdle to accomplish my goal. Yeah, I mean, visual programming tools are a good way to learn concepts. Um, I've Actually, I found Google Blocky, and one thing I liked about that is it has little checker pieces you can put together yeah. to do logic or if-then logic. Yeah. But also it has a game you can play using the tools. <laughs> uh, but I, I really suggest anybody in the chat go check it out because there's a maze game that ate up about two hours of my time just playing it over and over again. So this, this, is, uh, so this is you take you take a few things, you put it together, and then uh, by just like by, you must have like a library of, of blocks that you can pull from and then you just snack them, snap them all together. That's exactly right. This kind of reminds me a little bit of, uh, of Illumination Software Creator. This is yeah, this is kind of a, a little brother could say to Illumination Software Creator, right? Um, I would even say this is probably an even more beginner tool because you can do much more complex things in Illumination. Right. This this well the other the other goal that Brian has with Illumination is multiple uh, platform, which is which add a huge layer of complexity. Although this does um, compile the code out to J, uh, JavaScript, Dart, and I believe Python. Okay. Well, that's not bad. It's not. It's not quite the same, but yeah, it's, not, it's not. It's not the same idea. I mean, Illumination is yeah. definitely a step. I mean, you could theoretically ship an app you, you made in Illumination. Right. Right. This is not that kind of thing. Huh. So Blocky and and Illumination Software Creator are obviously things that have been have been have been created to try to try to solve that problem that I have, where I feel like it's such a big leap from what I want, what my goal is, to starting. I mean, the idea, people say, you know, just use a text editor. The idea of starting at that level to me seems daunting, um, even, even when it comes down to scripting. So what I've, always, what I've always done is I've, this is why open source has always worked so well for me. It's because usually I can go find an equivalent of something somebody's trying to do that's close to what I'm attempting to do. I can look at it and in some cases take the code and, and just modify that. And that's always been my approach to it because it's always just, I just need this thing to, to fit. I, I can squeeze this, this square into this round hole. I'll just push real hard. <laughs> yeah, open source is a great, uh, great way to learn. I mean, I would probably not recommend someone learning programming to bust open Vim or Emacs and just go. Um, you know, there's open source IDEs like Eclipse that, and NetBeams that have plugins with auto-completion and um, IntelliSense. Mm-hmm. That would definitely help you out. Um, I, I would say there's no reason to suffer if you don't have to. It's true, though, when you become proficient, you'll if you do learn Emacs or Vim or a tool like that, you'll be so much faster. Well, let me ask you this. 
uh, we're we're talking about this, and it, we're kind of talking about this in in the context of like, you have any choice in the world, anywhere you want to start, it's great, it's unlimited candy, you just have to climb the mountain. But the the reality is, uh, if if I make an application in Ruby or whatever, okay. whatever you want to call it. I, if I want to make money on it, I need to submit it to an app store somewhere now today. In today's, in the real world, if I'm a developer and I want to make money, don't I need to be in an app store? And then aren't I, if I need to be in an app store, then immediately limited as to what my development choices are? Yes, you are. But I would challenge that you necessarily need to be in an app store. Okay. I would say if you're writing a Mac app or even an app for Ubuntu and you want to hit a very wide audience, you need to be in the app store. If you're, you could be doing a web app. Um, if you're even doing a Windows app, there is no app store. Not yet. Not yet. But also, the Windows 8 app store is supposed to be for Metro apps. So if you, even if you're doing a desktop app, you're not going to be there. Well, welcome to the future. I mean, I think I think Microsoft's going to push Metro-based apps yeah. very heavily. That's another issue. Yeah, that's another. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding, right? Uh, I mean, I, I I guess maybe I'm just being a little, maybe I'm being a little more cynical than I should. But to me. To me, it feels like the the elephant in the room is Apple, and uh, I yeah. mean, if you want to really truly monetize a mobile application or a desktop application these days, their app stores are making developers money. Well, let's take Apple as an example. Um, for a beginner, it's definitely great to be able to submit an iPhone app and show it to friends and family. But Objective C can be a little rough. I mean, it's. They're, they it is Coco is a higher level um, mm-hmm. platform, but a lot of the time to do anything complex you have to drop into C because Objective C is just a superset on C, right? Uh, and that I would not encourage that. I'd say if you're starting out, start with the highest level of abstraction. So start with a uh, just start with something higher than C or Objective C. Oh, okay. It's you're better off writing a small app that you use yourself in something like Ruby or Python. And really getting a good learning experience in say four months, than beating yourself for a year trying to write something in Objective C or even C plus plus. Oh, okay. Because I'll just get you're saying you just get super frustrated. Well, up until iOS five, and just using Apple as an example, you had to do manual memory management in Objective C. Right. Right. I've had to explain that to interns and other. Which seems like an area where I could make a huge mistake as a rookie. Huge mistake, especially if you just came out of school and only know Java and are used to a garbage collector. Yeah, it's it's just really not the place, especially if you're a hobbyist or someone just trying to learn for fun. I I would go more the Ruby Python Python route. Go um, with Python now. Uh, so you say just to learn, just to learn, learn some concepts first, and then if you want to jump into a lower level, by all means. But, um, yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, that really does because uh, I, sometimes in the journey, you you know, I, I, I could see myself finding new uses and utilities for it, and just kind of living in Python for a while. Um, I actually, I actually so serious about. It. I actually have a book right here about, about beginning <laughs> Python. So I mean, I've already gotten the book and everything like that. Yeah, one good recommendation from the chat: uh, Enigma recommends you work on an open source project. That'd be that really cool, a, wouldn't it? That's a great way to learn. But you have to pick a small open source project that actually needs help. Right. I don't want to be the determined. You know, my end goal would be uh, this little background. Actually, uh, the way I met Michael was uh, originally uh, I was thinking a lot about, uh, you know, Jupiter Broadcasting doesn't have a strong presence on mobile. And, uh, of course, you know, everything's available on the web and everything's available via RSS. So, you know, if you just use a regular podcasting client, you're fine. But people, you know, these days kind of expect an app. Um, or whatever. And uh, I started talking to Michael because I, I wanted an app. And uh, I don't know, did you hear me mention it on a show? Or uh, Anyways, you and I ended up talking. And what I wanted to do was create an app that was consistent across Android and iOS that people could use in, to, to experience our, our back catalog and maybe the live stream and things like that. And I quickly discovered, you know, the functionality that I wanted and the, the look and style were going to be pretty expensive. So I, you know, kind of shelve that idea but then later on we started talking about doing a podcast so it all actually worked out um that would be my end goal is i would want to develop something that i could release for the network but i'd want it to be as good as it could be and i just don't know you know that seems like that's a long ways out but it's it's a challenge i'm willing to take on eventually 
Yeah, so in your situation, you're a great candidate, and I think we did talk about this for HTML5. Yeah. You're yeah. not doing a game. You don't need hyper-performance that the lower-level um, framework will give you, or, I'm sorry, lower-level language. Um, but the only issue is that if you use an Android experience on iOS, iOS users aren't going to like it. And if you do iOS stuff on Android, it's going to seem weird. So I either have to like come up with my own custom look, or I have to skin it depending on the browser agent? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, the sad part is most people just do the iOS stuff on Android. I mean, they yeah. write one HTML5 app, they put yeah, it in there. Yeah, you know, but our Android presence is, is uh, we're pretty, you know, uh, we, aren't, we aren't your typical uh, demographic, you know, Jupyter Broadcasting. We have, oh, sure. um, you know, we have just about as much Android visiting the site as we do iOS. And I think that is the iPad's event. a bit of a winner, you know. iPad is 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 a little higher than than the others, but uh, uh, as far as like phones go, it's it's pretty neck and neck. And on the iPad, pad, you need a whole different view layer anyway um, for the larger screen. So yeah, yeah. But I mean, there there have been leaps forward, and uh, I actually recently did a project in PhoneGap. Um, there are definitely stumbling blocks in PhoneGap. One thing I found that on older versions of Android, it can randomly crash. Oh. And it's an, was a known issue at the time. Yuck. Uh, but PhoneGap is a great way to do it. Again, leveraging, bringing it back to leveraging open source. It's a great way to not only speed up your development, but if you're a beginner and you know some JavaScript, anybody can write a PhoneGap plugin and put it on GitHub. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's it's just JavaScript that can, hooks into their API. But okay, can I ask you this though? Um, in terms of uh, in terms of functionality, if I go HTML5 based application. Uh, aren't I then negating some of the native OS features? Like, I would love to do the, a bat signal, like they're talking about in the chat room, where when we go live, if you want to, you just check the option box in the app, and boom, you get, an, you get a push notification when Coder Radio is live. So that's kind of a loaded question. Uh, you will be giving up some native functionality. There are, I believe, ways to do push notifications through HTML5. Wow. Wait. Something like PhoneGap because PhoneGap itself will hook into the native API, ah. and I might not be 100% right on that, but I'm pretty sure you can. I know it's limited though, very gotcha. limited. Gotcha. Hmm. And, and that's kind of the sacrifice with those kind of uh, web technology tools on mobile. And I guess the platforms might eventually improve oh. that. You know, more or, like or, more more like skating to where the puck's gonna be in that case. They could, or they could go the other way and break your functionality. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh man, I can't wait to put all this time and effort into building the perfect app and then just have them pull the rug out from underneath me. Well, that's a risk when you take a big dependency like that. If yeah. you take, let's say, you know, not, not to beat up on PhoneGap, there's other choices, but PhoneGap's the most popular. It could break tomorrow if Apple or Google decides they want it to break. Right, yeah. Oh, that's always the case, right? I mean, uh, I've had, I've, I, I've specifically have had things that I've depended on with Google that they just pull the functionality on and it's like, okay, all right, well guess I'll come up with a new way to do that. It's, it's okay. Just write it for Windows 8. You'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> write it for Metro. And the other thing, too, you know, really before I go on is, uh, uh, so I my, my two concerns were is, one, is, uh, am I a little more, if I do want to make it into an app store, I'm kind of I'm sort of channeled in, in some directions, but, you know, that doesn't mean, that doesn't, like you point out, that doesn't dictate where I have to start, so I can still start with Python and learn there. The other thing, though, is, how how much of a barrier? And I know this could be a much bigger topic, so you don't have to you don't have to cover the whole thing. But should I be worried about the investment up front to do all this work and then have my app rejected? Yes. Oh well, that makes me feel great. The answer is yes. I mean, simply yes. Um, there, the, I do a lot of work on the more restrictive platform, but it is a very real risk. It's you. You, if you read the terms, you can be rejected for any reason or no reason. And they're not obliged to tell you. Right, right. The uh, the guys at Rogue Amoeba uh, this last couple of weeks just had a big, uh, a big brouhaha with Apple over their app, which added some functionality that users genuinely wanted, uh, the ability to stream audio from your device to the Rogue Amoeba, Amiga app. So if you had an iPhone, you, right? Am I getting this right? If you had an iPhone, you could stream it to the iPad. and, and well, I, I would even say a more um, ridiculous example is... Recently, apps that integrated with Dropbox were rejected because seven clicks in, literally seven clicks, through the Dropbox sign-up flow, you could pay for Dropbox in Safari. Yeah, so this is this is a problem with the gatekeeper thing. 
uh, or actually gatekeepers, not the right term to use, but this is a problem with, with the new model. And I don't mean to sound like an old codger, but back in the day, you know, you would just release an app and you'd put it out for download or you'd put it up on a site and Bob's your uncle. Now you've got, you know, a share where you can download it. There's no, you know, there's no, there's nobody controlling that except for you. Yeah, it's a, a there's definitely a sacrifice to the app store, but on the other side, in some cases, it's the only real distribution platter. Uh, I'm sorry, platform. In the other case, Android, it's really the best one. I mean, Google Play. If you if you have an Android app, I Google Play is the way to go. Oh well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about Google Play or I mean, not even really Amazon. Amazon's actually fairly strict. Really? Maybe they're, they're, I should be. <laughs> They don't have the same, so they're strict about different things. Um, like Apple will sometimes be upset about design issues. Right. Again, sure. it, the bottom line is if you're if you're on one of these platforms, you're using their app store. You really have to just know what you're getting into. They all have documentation on what you can and cannot do, mm-hmm. and they are for the most part consistent. You know, if you think something's a gray area, send an email before you invest anything. And maybe yeah. talk to friends that have been in or similar situations. Or send an email to Coder Radio at jupiterbroadcasting.com and ask Michael his opinion. And send it to me, and I'll say no to everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, any other thoughts on that, or should we move on? Oh, I think a seg- segue is good into the... Uh App, the app store issue. I agree. Let me uh, let me take a pause here, and uh, uh, before we go on, because the the app store the app store thing brings up a lot of details. I think we can get into. So uh, I want to just mention that uh, you can support this show and other shows on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network by using our Chrome plugin if you have Chrome or the affiliate links over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Uh, yes, yes. If you if you browse over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and scroll all the way down to the very bottom, you'll find our affiliate links down there or the Chrome extension, and you can help support the development of these very shows. So thank you, everybody, who does that. All right, Michael. I just want to take a quick. I just want to make a quick mention of that. Uh, why don't we talk about uh, the App Store, like you mentioned, and also I'd like to uh, touch on a topic that you mentioned, where is some languages like Objective C. Until recently, you had to do your own memory management, which seems like it could lead a newbie like me down to making some very bad programming decisions, which could impact my project later. Uh, so I'd like to talk about that too. So uh, you mentioned App Stores. So is there more on that you wanted to touch on? Well, I kind of wanted to play devil ad- devil's advocate on Ooh, the App Store. Oh, okay, all right, I'm up for this. And I'm a developer, and I get upset when I have to worry about restrictions that might appear to be arbitrary. But, you know, you heard about this LinkedIn mess this week? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, the the password database leak. Uh Uh-huh, how about the path issue when they were uploading everybody's contacts? Uh, no, path is the uh, social network, right? Yes. So what they were doing is when you logged into Path, it would pull your contacts and upload them straight in raw text. To oh, oh, this is a little while ago. I did know about this. Yeah, yeah, this is bad stuff. They got in a lot of trouble, though. They got in trouble, but they did it for how many months first? Yeah, and who else could be doing it? Didn't Twitter, uh, didn't Twitter uh, uh, announce that they also were doing that? And they I stopped? Think Twitter encrypted it weekly. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and, and this is a common thing. I mean, we could literally sit here at Google and beat up on any number of apps we wanted to. Yeah. But my point is, playing devil's advocate, so let's avoid the flame, uh, there is a reason these app stores exist, other than user convenience. And there's a reason these platform vendors are being restrictive. And that's because we all kind of made dumb mistakes. Um, You know, uploading somebody's contacts in plain text is really bad. From a security perspective, that's awful. Yeah. LinkedIn's thing, I think, is actually worse, going into your calendar and pulling your appointments from a business perspective. Yeah. You know, let's say if me and you were more secretive about the show, they saw I had a chat with you on my calendar. Well, actually, the whole launch was very, it was the most secretive show launch I've ever done. Nobody knew about it. LinkedIn couldn't have blown it completely. Yeah. I mean, on 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 our level, it's probably not a big deal, but let's say Apple and Microsoft want to merge. Right. (laughs) Right. That could be, I mean... That's just a real invasion of privacy, and it's, yeah. I understand it's not illegal, it's not a crime, but it's a, it's a case of com- a company putting its own need for data, or, or, or desire, I would say desire in that case, for data, right. over its users. Mm-hmm. So what have the platform vendors done? 
Apple, for the most part, has come down really hard. Yeah. You know, I said, this is what you will do. You'll do nothing else. Um, Windows 8 is going to be pretty restrictive from, from what I've read. Uh, the Ubuntu Software Center. I'm a little sketchy on that. I know they're pretty liberal, but I do see a future where they're, they review like everybody else. You think so? I, I agree just because they want to build a brand around that whole software store. and They want it to be considered sort of curated, I think. Yeah, I, and I'm, I've actually been for a project looking into the Ubuntu Software Center and the development of platforms. One thing I noticed right off the bat is they have a lot of different platforms that you can use Java, Python, web technologies, um, and a number of others. I wouldn't be surprised if that got cut down in the name of security or in the name of consistency. And they have it wide right now because they want to try to get as many of the really good open source apps in there that they can. And there, you know, there's just a wide range that those are written in. Uh, if they made that change, you know, if they got more specific, they might have to remove some of the community's favorite open source applications. So they don't really have, uh, oh. right now, from a technology standpoint, if you install something that, uh, say, is written in uh, C Sharp, mm -hmm. and uh, you don't have uh, the oh, mono runtime, you know, the App Store will just go get the dependencies for the mono runtime and install them on your system. So it sounds like you're assuming that to do it for paid apps, Ubuntu would have to do it for open source apps. Oh, right. Nothing so, stops them for saying, if you're under these licenses, do what you want. If you're a commercial application, you're using our API, our programming language. Maybe they have a few options. And uh, this UI framework, which on Linux is, you know, on Microsoft, you have Metro. Apple, you have Cocoa, I mean, and Aqua. On Linux, there's GTK, Unity, um, random other, we use KDE, but does anybody? Oh, man, you're going to get some hate mail for that. <laughs> I like hate mail. I'm, I'm sorry. You know, you, I, you might be right. Uh, the thing is, is Canonical could become more draconian and restrictive and still be the most developer-friendly uh, open of all of them. It, it There's looks, a lot of room still for them to contract and still be the more liberal of the, of the platform vendors. Yeah, I mean, working a lot in the Apple space and just kind of using Ubuntu on my other machine and keeping in touch with the community, mm -hmm. it it feels like that's what they're doing. But they're taking baby steps. And I that may not be a bad thing. I mean, you have, again, devil's advocate. If a subset of developers are doing things that are dangerous for the user, you know, the platform is responsible for their users. They, uh, Canonical might also feel like they need to start changing the perception of the quality of Linux desktop apps. And so if they can start being a little more draconian, they can kind of bring that bar up a little bit. Not that it's it's actually higher than it's ever been. But I think today, if somebody develops an application, there's like some apps will just get tearn, torn up on the Mac platform and on the Windows platform. And on Linux, they'll still be loved because some, you know, there's just there's hit and miss on the quality of apps. Now, that's not quite the case anymore, but that bar, I think, needs to come up another rung now. And I think Canonical is probably aware of that because, honestly, if those apps come up another rung quality, then, you know, their revenues will go up another rung. Absolutely. And let's look at it just from security. It's reasonable to say we're going to be very liberal on open source apps because they have a whole community of developers watching everybody else's commits and everybody else's code. Uh, something that's 100% proprietary and written by one person or a small team, how do they know the code's been reviewed for security? Yeah, true. I mean, it's, it's an extreme case, but with things like Flame and Stuxnet, you know, the implausible is possible. <clears throat> yeah, um, because both of those have taken advantage of zero-day exploits. In fact, Flame takes advantage of some sort of programming, or some sort of error in Windows that they're not even sure what it is yet. So, obviously, mistakes can be exploited. Um, mistakes can be exploited, and, I mean, the most extreme example of what I'm talking about, which I think is just awful, is the uh, gatekeeper on OS X that's coming. Uh, are you familiar with this at all, Chris? I or? am, yeah. So, this is a system where, uh, by default, new Macs will ship requiring that every application that's run be signed by Apple. Correct. And, of course, the user can turn it off with a toggle in system preferences, um, and I think there's also an option to leave it on but warn you, right? Or something like that? By default, it will warn you. Okay. Uh, so, 
because it can be turned off, it doesn't seem like it's super evil, but it seems like it's the perfect kind of feature that in the next iteration of OS X, maybe it's like a command line flag to turn off. Or like maybe you like have to, you know, adjust a plist file or something. And then and then the next iteration after that, it's totally it's just it's on. What do you think? Maybe. I mean, it, it, trying to theorize about what they're going to do is uh, is tough, but really, given the amount of penetration the Mac App Store has, and this was kind of more to my point, to be in the Mac App Store, there are a lot of things you cannot do that you can normally do in Mac OS. Right, right. For instance, reference um, explicit paths on the file system. So like user, shared, blah, blah, blah. So like if uh, if I wanted to access the uh, MP3 lame encoder uh, file that's in user local or whatever, I, I can't do that. Uh, to my knowledge, no. That's what that's what the blogs are saying. That's what other podcasts are saying. Yeah, no, that's what I've read too. And it it uh, it it basically it appifies uh, desktop apps. It makes them exactly. nearly as limited in functionality as mobile apps in some ways. Exactly. And the deadline for for what they call sandboxing was, I believe, June first. Yeah, um, yeah. So there have been developer, for, exa- for example, there is a very popular um, IDE on Mac called Coda and Coda 2. There's mm-hmm. two versions. Mm-hmm. The developer actively tells people, you can get the Mac App Store one, but it's gimped. Right. Compared to the uh, one he sells on his website because he can't read from the path. He can't read the file system in the way that he needs to for some of his functionality. The App Store, uh, from an end user perspective, because, you know, I have uh, Macs for editing. And um, now it is, if, if I have to reinstall a Mac or something like that, I, I install the OS, mm-hmm. I open up the App Store, and I hit click, install, 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 and I come back 20 minutes later, and I have um, a completely ready-to-go video editing and audio editing workstation. And the, the before the App Store... That literally was a two-day process of sitting here and swapping because all of these, I had a stack of programs that came and each one had five or six DVDs and I have to sit here and just rotate them all through and it would just take forever. I mean, it has fundamentally optimized that process for me. Uh, So as an end user, I think it's great. But from a technology standpoint, I mean, even how can Apple's own applications like Final Cut work in these kinds of restrictions? How is that possible? Final Cut is all about the file system. <laughs> you know, I mean, right. all these videos are all over the file system everywhere. They're going to have to make an exception for for how about motion? How what about right. logic? The logic is sold. Logic records to a file on your file system. Uh, they're going to have to make some of these changes. They're going to have to make exceptions. Well, so on the so I think they do make they could make exceptions, but. Technically, in the API, you you can save things on disk, but it has to be in the app's little document directory. Right, so it's a storage can, area. Nothing prevents apps from doing that, and there's also iCloud and similar functionality. Yeah, so man, that, I, I just, I mean, I'm dealing with I'm dealing with you know 120 gigs worth of data per project. Oh yeah. you know, it's not a solution for the pro market, but app stores really aren't for the pro market. But they're putting pro apps in there. They are. I, okay, so I'm not a video editor, but I, my programming tools aren't from the App Store except for Xcode. That's because I don't have a choice. Yeah, yeah. I don't look to these type of programs, these type of applications. Well, let me play devil's advocate with Gatekeeper, okay? Because you seem like you're pretty down on it. Let me, let me do the flip side. As somebody who's been a system administrator for, uh, I'm coming on 14, 15 years now, uh, I can tell you that users and users are the biggest problem a network has ever had. Networks run amazing until you add users. And part of it is, is they're just, and I'm not talking about anybody in our audience, and I'm not trying to talk down about people, but I mean, people just click on things and do things they shouldn't do. And if I could restrict my end users to only run approved applications, I would do it in a heartbeat because it would dramatically improve the rate of uh, support and level of support that they need. And on top of that, it makes the company more, more, re- more profitable. Their time isn't taken up and things like that. And I'm not talking about locking things down and saying, oh, you can't run solitaire, you can't run chess. I'm just saying, you can't run this unless some higher authority has verified that it's cool. That's yeah, all I, I mean, want. That's all I want. So right off the bat, and I'm going to say this and I will defend this, all my apps work fine until a user touches them. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so maybe we should be locking down the user himself. Well, yeah. I mean, isn't that yeah? Isn't that next? 
No, but seriously, you are right. There is a need for the app stores. Um, it serves a big, big market. So as a developer, I can't ignore it. You're right. Yeah. W- would you be up for? Uh, would you be up like if you ever had some sort of hit application? Uh, would you be up for making an uh, app store version and a web downloadable version? I mean, you're you're essentially dealing with two builds, then, right? Yes. You'd have to come up with a system to manage that, I would imagine. Uh, well, so currently using the Mac App Store because it's really the only one that's really, really big for commercial apps. Even if you have a license to the non-App Store version, you don't get a license to the App Store version. And there's nothing the dev can do for you. Right. So that is less a programming problem and more a messaging problem to the, to the market. We ought to, you know, Michael, we ought to take things like like that issue and upgrades and charging for upgrades and things like that and make a whole show out of it at some point because I think... Yeah, that's a big issue yeah. because, again, on the App Store, you can't charge for an upgrade. You have to release a new app. Right. Right. Uh, currently. Yeah. And I think that would be an interesting topic to, to kind of kick around for a bit and uh, and because uh, uh, it, you know... It's it is the the theory I guess that they rely on is that continuing volume of growth will just you know you'll that's where your sales will come from and if you want to release a new version you have to just release a whole new app uh, and that seems like there's a lot of implications there and I think we could talk about it from a business standpoint too like how do you manage that from a revenue standpoint and things like that I mean I th- really think that could be its own show it definitely could it's it's a also in addition to that how have the prices of programs changed or apps I, they're interchangeable for me. Right. Um, yeah. If big. You notice, right. Since these app stores, prices have been going way down. Mm-hmm. Um, has volume really gone up? I'd, I'd like to see some hard, hard numbers on that. Yeah, I I have seen some. I have seen okay. some, and uh, it seems to be you know it depending on on where you rank, and in what categories you rank in, uh, it can make you know a multi 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 factor difference. So it's an interesting it's an interesting beast to follow, and it's a whole new world. And you know, I I I think what one of the things I, I'm really going to enjoy from this show is uh, is getting uh, your business perspective and sort of I mean I've already picked up on a few parallels between our two different industries, and that's that's really exciting. Just to it's so interesting to see some of our commonalities, even though we work on different things and where they do intersect. So and you know, I've I've always worked hand in hand with software developers. And I've always had a lot of respect for what uh, is entailed in that. So. I'm I'm really looking forward to covering this with you. I just have to ask you one question. Yeah, you're administering a server. Is it is it like Windows 2003? <laughs> oh, plenty, plenty. Yeah, I uh, for a little while, uh, I I was probably in charge of two, three hundred Windows 2003 servers. Uh, uh, but you know, I I primarily work with Linux servers. So, so one day, remind me to mention XML from Windows 2003. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh man! Oh oh man! There are uh, every now and then on TechSnap we have war stories. I have so many so many Linux and Windows Server war stories that are just the most ridiculous things that you run into. Yeah, try hooking into it with a uh, non-Windows client. Ah, yeah, it's a good time. Oh, weird from Microsoft. That's odd. Yeah, they were and really that 2003. Things were starting to change, but they were still really bad about that kind of stuff back then. Very yeah. bad. That's a bit of a tangent. Uh, yeah. One last thing on this point. Yeah. I see a lot of a Metro hating in the uh, IRC chat. Yeah, I, I noticed I that. Want, <laughs> I just wanted to mention the Windows 8 App Store. So they're taking a different approach. Yeah. They're not saying all programs must go through us. They're saying all, essentially, tablet programs must go through, right, through us. Right, right. Or any desk, like they have a desktop Twitter app. You know, you could, you know. You can, but you don't have to, right? So right. there's a... Right. Yeah. And that is probably the one market where this won't happen, I'd huh. say. Just well, because of there's so much legacy. I'm I'm gonna be watching that Metro App Store with a little with a little interest, but honestly with more s- skeptical glasses on than I should. I'm gonna be Mr. Skeptical Pants with it, I think. You're gonna, you're gonna be feeling the hate, huh? Yeah. Hey, uh, before we uh, before we wrap up, do you mind if I mention our song of the week this week? And I don't know if we'll do this every week, but uh, people always, whenever we launch a new show that includes the wonderful Ronald Jenkins in it, they always ask, where did that music come from? So if you watch this episode or any episode of Coder Radio and you want to know where that music came from, the song is called Gold Spinners, and it's from Ronald Jenkins' album, self-titled Ronald Jenkins. It's $9 over on Amazon, and uh, you can get, like, our very own Gold Spinners right here. Yeah. They got song ever. He, a great song. He's got uh Snap. This uh this CD is a really good one. 
So I will put a, uh, a link in the show notes if you want to support the show and grab uh, Ronald Jenkins. He's, uh, I just, you know, I, I found him a couple of years ago and uh, my kids love him and I love him. It's just, it's nice to have some music that both dad and the kids enjoy. <laughs> You know what Not I mean? Bad. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now, hey, before we get out of here, I know you had a tool of the week you want to do. You want to do the tool of the week every week, right? Oh, I'm very excited about this tool. Do we have time? Oh, yeah, totally, man. Go ahead. All right. So it's um, it's a web app called Coding with a K. So K-O-D-I-N-G. Okay, clever. I have been begging these guys. It's in beta. I've been begging for a beta invite for three months. I finally got one last week. Oh. It is incredible. Um, right now, it's very beta, so... You know, don't do any production work uh, unless you want to get fired. But it has in syntax highlighting right in your web browser for development. Um, some IntelliSense, but it seems hit or miss right now. There's JavaScript. There's um, can do Ruby. They claim I haven't tried Ruby. I've basically and, been doing JavaScript. And it looks like there's like a, a live community tie-in aspect too. Yep, it hooks into GitHub. If Ooh, you're okay. okay. Yeah. Um, additionally, and this is this is kind of their killer feature. You don't have to run like I have a, a Dell server to my right. Sure. For testing. You don't need that. This thing will do that for you. Oh, they'll like spin up like a virtual machine to run it on or something. I'm hesitant to say if it's really a virtual machine. Right. Oh yeah, that's true. It could be. Yeah. It could be. I've only been playing with it for yeah. about a week, but every yeah. everything I've tried to do has worked. That's awesome. Um, and they say they can run your Ruby code and show it to you in any problems. Oh, and they also have their own little terminal. So you are actually considering coding in the cloud. <laughs> to the cloud, baby, to the cloud. Wow, I think there's some old school people that would think that's just absolutely crazy. Don't you think? Well, I mean, okay. Why is it crazy? You're willing to have a Google Hangout, a phone call in the cloud. Why not have an IDE in the cloud? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'd be curious, and maybe people can let us know. Let us email us, coderadio at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Are you comfortable coding in the cloud? Or does it make you nervous? You're worried you're going to lose something? And, you, you know, I, with the, with a site like that, you know they kind of have to have a, a, a pretty good developer-friendly EULA, too, because you, you don't want one of those clauses like, everything you develop, we own. <laughs> you know? <Yeah. laughs> All right, man. Well, guess what? I think that wraps up the first episode. That's it. Now, uh, Coder Radio is live Mondays at 9 a.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv. That's noon Eastern. Music in this episode is created by Ronald Jenkins. Link in the show notes. Check that out. Uh, Michael, where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Dumanuco, D O M I N U C C O. Nice. And you're on Google Plus? I am. You can just search my name, Michael yeah. Dominic. And there's a link in the show notes. Also, you got a website people should check out. Yep, uh, mdominic.com is a, a tech blog, and if you want to find my professional stuff or my company site, it's fingertiptech.com. Fingertiptech.com. And I'm over at twitter.com slash chrislas. Thanks for listening to this week's episode, everyone. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>